Beneath the Planet of the Apes, the first sequel to the groundbreaking science fiction classic Planet of the Apes, was a surprise hit at the box office. Naturally, 20th Century Fox wanted another sequel. The only problem? At the end of Beneath, the world exploded in a nuclear holocaust, killing all of the characters. Where could the filmmakers go from there? Into the past, of course. So writer Paul Dane cleverly engineered an escape from the Planet of the Apes. Before Beneath the Planet of the Apes is released, Fox starts discussions with Paul Dane about the potential for a third film. And Paul Dane comes up with the idea, what if Cornelius and Zira get off the planet right before it explodes? What if Dr. Milo is this kind of Leonardo da Vinci character that is just brilliant and a man ahead of his time, and he's able to figure out how to make this spaceship work, and they actually escape from the Planet of the Apes before it's destroyed, and they go back in time into Earth, and they start the whole cycle all over again. It's a smaller movie, but I think in a lot of ways a better movie. I mean, the script is impeccable. Uh, the production went absolutely without a hitch. Paul Dane came up with a great script where the apes salvage Charlton Heston's spacecraft and get it going and wind up going back in time to modern day Los Angeles. In the second sequel, Escape from the Planet of the Apes, they cleverly said it in present day Los Angeles, which I thought, I, I remember when it came out at the time, I said, hey, this is a great idea, that's a way of doing it, and a way of keeping the story fresh because you weren't back with only apes. By going back in time and Escape from the Planet of the Apes, what it gives them a chance to do is start telling an origin story. How did Planet of the Apes become Planet of the Apes? In that first film, you're faced with this world ruled by apes. You don't know exactly what happened and how. That's part of the shock, that's part of the excitement about it. When they go back and escape from the Planet of the Apes to the 1970s, then they're able to start telling the prehistory of the Planet of the Apes. They're able to start developing how did we get to where we wound up in that first film. We're gonna show you essentially the backstory. We're gonna show you the backstory after you've seen the forestory. We're gonna give you the history of the Planet of the Apes. To give the backstory of Planet of the Apes, Paul Dane consulted the ultimate authority, writer Pierre Boulle's original novel. Keeping the edgy social criticism of Rod Serling's first adaptation and the humorous satire from Boulle's initial vision, Dane developed an original story that incorporated some of the best features of both. The fact that the apes are wearing suits and ties and pantsuits and 1970s garb, it gives you a sense of what that original Rod Serling concept might have looked like had they gone and they'd done the apes in a modern society with regular contemporary clothes. It also, I think, points to one of the reasons why that initial concept wouldn't have worked, because it is so humorous. When you see an ape in a suit and tie, you're just going to laugh. The humor really comes out in Escape from the Planet of the Apes. The original opening for what was then titled Secret of the Planet of the Apes was to have the three astronauts, the three aponauts, Cornelius, Milo, and Zira, in the spaceship that they had salvaged from Taylor, in outer space, watching the Earth destroyed. And there was footage shot, the opening scenes depicted the Earth's destruction as it happens in beneath from the view of the cockpit of the spacecraft. So there was some footage shot for the opening of the film. That's how the film was going to open. Later on, they determined that it would be more of a hook opening and would be kind of a laugh and it would serve the picture better instead of opening with a dramatic explosion that, since this was very much a love story, human interest story, that the first time you realize that these are the apes or that there's any reference really made to the previous film is when they remove their helmets the Army believes that the three astronauts are going to take their helmets off, and it turns out to be three apes. In a lot of ways, Escape from the Planet of the Apes is an inverse of the first film. Whereas Planet of the Apes, you have a human being that lands on a primitive planet ruled by apes. 
you switch that and escape from the Planet of the Apes, and you have the apes that land in a modern technological society run by humans. Because Escape from the Planet of the Apes was set in current day Los Angeles, they didn't have to make up everybody as an ape. They only had certain key players who were the apes, and everybody else was human. And they were able to get by on the reduced budgets to make uh, thoroughly enjoyable movies. Part of the advantage that they had doing that was because you didn't have to create elaborate sets, you could save a lot of money and you could use existing facilities. They shot at the Los Angeles Zoo. They shot on Wilshire Boulevard in famous hotels. So they're able to get a lot of humor value out of the fact that you're seeing apes in suits and ties in contemporary American settings. And they're able to bring a kind of lighthearted sense to that until it starts to get dark about midway in the film, and then it shifts. And then that kind of intensity that Paul Dane had, that obsession that he had with racial warfare and with violence, that starts to filter its way through in that second half of the film. Director Don Taylor faced the challenge of balancing the humor, romance, and dark social criticism of the screenplay in a suspenseful science fiction thriller. Don Taylor, the director of Escape from the Planet of the Apes, saw the film as a love story. He really thought that the focus was the emotional connection between Kim Hunter's character and Roddy McDowell's character. And in a way, it's the emotional connection between the audience and Zira and Cornelius. Because the audience has had this affection for them they've built up over the first two films. And because they're charming and they're likable. Look, Cornelius and Zira in Escape from the Planet of the Apes, they're everything that you'd want in a friend. They're smart, they're loyal, they're funny, they're moral. They're just, they're, they're really good people. Madam Zira, what is your favorite fruit? Grape. Kim Hunter skillfully utilized her method actor's training to keep Zira believable and sympathetic. She displayed the full range of her talents early in her career when she co-starred as Stella, the wife of Marlon Brando's Stanley Kowalski, in the Tennessee Williams classic streetcar named Desire, winning an Academy Award for repeating her Broadway triumph in the movie. Mom was very serious. She had a process. She smoked a lot of cigarettes. And the smoking was an integral part of her learning lines. It gave her a moment to look at them and absorb them. She loved Marlon Brando. She thought he was a consummate craftsman. She loved the way he put his parts together. She loved the way he, I think she loved the man. She worked with him for a long time. She did the stage thing for Streetcar for two and a half years. And then they did the movie. After Streetcar came the McCarthy era, and there were some problems that she ran into. The reason that Kim was blacklisted was because she had been one of a number of notable people who signed a letter that was published in a newspaper supporting peace. And for this, she was deemed an American and a threat to the United States. The Hollywood blacklist limited Kim Hunter's appearances in movies during the 50s, allowing her to return to the stage. She appeared in several television roles until she returned to movie stardom as Zira in the original Planet of the Apes. The Planet of the Apes films are not the kinds of things that people get Academy Awards for. But even at the time, the critics were really impressed with how good a job Kim Hunter did, Roddy McDowell did, at really bringing a sense of depth and intelligence and humor and emotion and character to these apes. Did they make you tell them about Taylor, too? They made me tell them everything, Cornelius. Roots. Preparing for the role was very difficult for her, and it, and it involved going to the Bronx Zoo several times, watching chimpanzees and how they move, how they act. She's trying to figure out what happens if this animal in front of me gets smart and gets upright. What's it gonna be like? And that's part of method acting, I'm sure. Uh, it's a little odd, but it's, it's still part of method acting. And then I'm sure she had to sit down with Roddy 
and decide on a gate. They must have come to an understanding together because they both did it identically, a kind of shuffle, a little chimpanzee shuffle. And it was weight forward and your feet kind of catching up. The body mechanism, the body mannerisms were wonderful. Didn't stoop overly, didn't stand up too straight. You know, it was that evolved ape thing. And after all, these were evolved apes. Savages. <laughs> they are savages. Jabbing needles into my pregnant wife. My mother was claustrophobic. The makeup was a big problem for her. It took so long to put it on. It took so long to take it off. If you think about it, with the Planet of the Apes, things especially, the makeup is big and clunky. And it's her eyes and her voice yes. that give the performance. Her eyes have such humor in them, such questioning. Watching the movies, for me, her eyes always made it through. And for her to use her eyes the way she did was thrilling for me because it was my mother and it was terrific. I think that Kim and Zira had a lot in common. I think they're both shy. They work really hard at what they do. They're experts, they're perfectionists. And at the same time, they're opinionated. And to some degree, Kim has gotten in trouble for being opinionated like Zira. This woman held her own with Marlon Brando on a stage for two years and then on film. And I think after that, you fear nothing. I think it's that simple. I think Roddy and Kim had a special camaraderie that just really came across. Roddy was one of the people she loved from the first time she worked with him. And that relationship continued uh, until he died. She loved his approach, and she loved his energy, and it showed. The two of them worked so well together. Uh, it was like they had been, you know, uh, an old married couple for years. I hate deceit. Well, there is a time for truth, and a time not for lies, but for silence. You had to empathize with the apes, so they had to be very likable, very human. And uh, they did, I think, and Roddy was a little bit more uh, cynical, etc. cetera. But um, I, I think the characterizations that they were able to put forth were just absolutely amazing. Does the other one talk? Only when she lets me. <laughs> there was this sense of them as very, very likable characters that you respected and you had an emotional connection to. So when they're killed at the end, it's extremely sad. I mean, the way they're gunned down, the way the baby is gunned down. My God, stop him! The way that they have this loyalty to each other uh, through the end, that's really a product of really good writing and a product of very sympathetic portrayals, that the humanity, if I can use that word, of these characters and these actors really comes through through the performances. In addition to the political and social issues shared with the first two films, Escape from the Planet of the Apes also alluded to biblical stories and themes. The stories from the Bible are very much present. They're subtle, but they're very much present in a lot of those sequels. Uh, in Escape from the Planet of the Apes, when Dr. Hasslein wants to murder the baby Milo before he's born to prevent the apes from rising, the president says quite explicitly, Herod tried that and Christ survived. Alter what you believe to be the course of the future by slaughtering two innocents, or rather three, now that one of them is pregnant. Herod tried that and Christ survived. Mr. President, Herod lacked our facilities. He also became very unpopular, historically unpopular. There is this sense of using these biblical metaphors as a way to give moral weight to the stories that are being told. And in a way, what that does is it takes the political issues that are being dealt with, and it makes them not just about left-wing or right-wing or conservative or liberal, but about moral and immoral. In Escape from the Planet of the Apes, you have the son of Zero and Cornelius being born in a circus, kind of like a modern-day manger. And here's the savior child that's born amongst the animals and born amongst the hay and in the cages. 
there's that sense of a, of a savior figure that's being born. I hate those who try to alter destiny, which is the unalterable will of God. And if it is man's destiny one day to be dominated, then, oh, please, God, let him be dominated by such as you. The concept of the third movie was fun, and I think it was fun for the whole crew. I think that the fact that it, it did well was because of the lightness of it, after all the heaviness of the first two. Escape from the Planet of the Apes cost a mere $2 million to produce and grossed $20 million worldwide. But unlike the previous sequel, the new film perfectly set up its sequel. Audiences around the world wanted to know, what will happen to baby Milo? <laughs> <laughs>